than catfish, Bob. You know that curiosity killed a cat. How come you took that sleeve type pump apart? Uh, something wasn't working right, Tech. I figured some dirt got inside and maybe the pump just needed cleaning. Ah, uh, don't hand me that, my boy. I'll bet you were really curious and wanted to find out how that pump worked. Well, frankly, Tech, I did kind of wonder about that. I still don't know, and I'm not even sure I can get that pump back together. I know darn well you can. Not the way you're going at it now. And uh, you're not the first guy to get in a pickle like that. Just wait till Lee catches you with a pump all apart. He's not going to like it. Hey, I can hear you two screaming way across the shop. And I see what's happened. But instead of getting excited about Bob taking that pump apart, let's use those parts to talk about how the sleeve-type pump works and cover what's new in the way of service. I'd sure appreciate that, Lee. Don't if I could figure out how this pump operates. Well, Bob, you've noticed that both cylinder blocks have nine bores, and there are nine connecting sleeves to form nine tubular chambers. The front block with the splines does the driving. The other block is driven by the connecting sleeves. Now, if we follow one chamber with its sleeve through a complete cycle, you'll understand the basic operation of the pump. Notice what happens to one chamber, for instance. As one sleeve and both blocks turn one half a revolution, the chamber increases from its minimum to its maximum length. It goes from short to long. Then, during the remaining half revolution, the chamber decreases in length. It goes from long to short. Now, this change in chamber length provides positive displacement pumping action. As that chamber gets longer, Bob, it draws oil in from a suction port in the end cap, just like an engine piston on its intake stroke. Right. Now, as the chamber gets shorter, the oil passes through the sleeve and is forced out of the opposite end of the pump through a discharge port. Now, as you probably know, the oil is discharged through a combination flow and pressure relief valve. This combination valve maintains a constant flow level regardless of pump speed and pressure. Remember, Bob, all nine chambers, in turn, do the same job. Each chamber draws in oil and discharges it. There's a continuous flow of oil under pressure to the gear. There's oil under pressure throughout the pump, Bob. Each internal part works on a film of oil. A spring and plunger pushes both blocks out against the end cap and housing to form the seal until pressure builds up. When that happens... Fluid pressure in the space between the cylinder blocks forces the cylinders out to form a seal at the end cap and at the housing. So, as long as there's enough oil of the proper type and the oil is clean, the life of the internal parts will be excellent. What you're trying to tell me, in other words, is that I had no business taking the pump apart, huh? <laughs> yeah, only Lee's trying to be nice about it. But I guess you know by now that you shouldn't have done it. Just remember, Bob... You hardly ever have to get inside to locate the cause of poor pump performance. Always look for causes outside the pump first. In other words, check for loose or worn drive belts. Then see if the oil is up to level. Last, make a pressure test. Now, there's a quick way to find out if the belt's too loose. With a torque wrench, try tightening the pulley attaching bolt. If the reading reaches 20 foot-pounds before the pulley starts to slip, tension is tight enough to prevent slippage. I see. If it slips before 20, I adjust the belt. Right. And remember, always check oil level when oil is up to normal operating temperature. Don't worry. I never check oil level cold. Okay. I hope you wipe off the cap and filler neck before you check oil level. You can't be too careful about keeping dirt out. Don't worry, Tech. I keep that pump fluid so clean, you could drink it. <laughs> if it's the right brand, that's okay. You do use automatic transmission fluid A, don't you? Yes, but if a small amount of oil is needed to bring the level up, you could use SAE 10W, couldn't you? Only in an emergency, Bob. And in extremely cold weather, where there's a lot of below zero temperature, you can drain and refill with SAE 5W. Type A is so viscous at low temperatures, it's hard to push it around, even at cranking speed. But as soon as the extremely cold weather is passed, drain the pump and flush out the system. Refill with automatic transmission fluid type A. 
Engine oil won't do a good job in warmer weather. Good point. Now, Bob, let's suppose an owner reports jerky or hard steering near the end of a full left or right turn, or on and off power assist. If you found belt tension and oil level okay, you still have to determine whether the pump or the steering gear itself is at fault. And to do that, install this 1,500-pound gauge in the pressure line between the pump and gear. Make sure the gauge line valve is open so oil flow to the gear won't be restricted. Also, connect a tachometer as your guide to engine speed. Then, start the engine. Let it run until the pump reaches operating temperature. Then make sure engine idle is set at 475 to 500 RPM. Now, you're ready to close the gauge valve and shut off oil to the gear. Before you do, however, remember that pressures and temperatures rise mighty fast, and the valve shouldn't stay closed more than 20 seconds. So, gradually close the gauge valve and watch the gauge as you do. Keep your hand on the valve to open it quickly if pressure starts to go higher than 950 pounds. Pressure should rise to between 800 and 950 pounds. Open the valve after making this test. Now, if you get less than 800 pounds, pump output is too low. I see. If I didn't get enough pressure, that would rule out the gear and point to the pump as needing attention. Correct. And low pressure could be caused by dirt holding a valve open, loose end cap or body bolts, or maybe some scoring inside the pump. If the flow valve or the pressure relief valve inside it sticks open because of dirt, for example, the pump may not provide steering assistance. And that's why I took the pump apart. I was looking for dirt. Yeah, Bob, but you took the wrong end of it apart. More often than not, you'll find the trouble in the flow valve or pressure relief valve. Tech's right, Bob. And you won't have to worry about getting those cylinder blocks and sleeves back together. To inspect the valve, you first remove the pump and drain it. Then remove the reservoir. Unscrew this large hex nut that holds the flow valve and spring in the pump body. Remove the flow valve spool. The pressure relief valve is inside the spool. So, remove the screw in the end of the spool. This screw is the pressure relief valve ball seat. Also, remove the ball, ball retainer, and spring, and... Hey, hey, will you take a look at that? Yeah, see that piece of gook on the seat? That ball couldn't possibly seat properly. No wonder steering was jerky and on and off. Golly, it's a good thing we didn't dump these parts in solvent before looking them over. Ah, uh, you're so right, Bob. It would have destroyed the evidence. We never would have been sure we'd found the trouble. Inspect for dirt first. Then clean them up and check for scratches or nicks before reassembly. Good advice, Lee. But before we go any further... Somebody please turn this record over. After cleaning valve parts in a mineral solvent, use compressed air to dry them. Then look them over carefully for nicks, scratches, especially the flow valve spool and the valve liner. Check the fit of the spool in the liner. It should slide through the liner by means of its own weight. If it sticks at any point, find the nick or burr responsible and polish it out. Recheck spool movement in the bore. Now, if you come across a rare case where any of the valve parts are badly scored, remember that the spool valve and body are serviced as an assembly. I see. Replace the whole assembly, huh? Right. Now, to raise pressure, you can insert a 132nd inch washer between the spring and ball retainer. You follow that? Yep. Clear enough, Lee. But suppose I don't find anything wrong with that spool valve assembly at all. Where else in the pump would I have to check? Well... See if you get 15 foot-pounds torque on the end cap and pump body screws first. That's easiest and could cause low pressure. If the torque's okay, then disassemble the pump and inspect the parts. Excessive scoring of the blocks, sleeves, end cap, or body can cause low pressure. Besides that, a broken plunger spring won't hold the cylinder blocks against the end cap or body and the pump may not prime. Okay. I'll check that and look those parts over for nicks or scoring. Now, minor scratches or scuff marks on the blocks of the body won't hurt operation. And if each sleeve has a smooth slip fit in the bores, with some suction when you hold both ends closed as you withdraw the sleeve, 
The fit's probably all right. Say, that sounds like a good idea. Any more good tips? Well, suppose I show you how to put the sleeves and blocks together by using this new assembly fixture. Put this cylinder block without splines on the fixture first. Oil and insert the plunger spring, plunger and seven sleeves next. Put the pump body over the block and fixture. Space the sleeves evenly and insert the other two sleeves. Following that, place the splined block over the sleeves. Sight through the bores and lower the block until it engages the two sleeves in the forward position. Again, use the probe to align the next two sleeves while you push the driving block gently downward. Line up the next pair of sleeves and guide the block down over them. Finally, line up the remaining sleeves and gently push the driving block all the way. Don't let me catch you forcing that driving block into place, Bob. Take it easy and line up those sleeves as you push the block over them. Easy does it. Okay. What's next? Well, next, you remove the parts from the fixture and install the end cap using a new gasket. Tighten the cap screws finger tight to keep the driven block in place. Now, you assemble the pump body to the housing. Be sure to use a new body gasket and flow valve seal ring. Next... Slip the pulley on the shaft and rotate the pump. It should turn freely without any binding. Once you check that, torque the cap screws evenly to 15 foot-pounds. Recheck the pump shaft again to make sure it doesn't bind. And finally, tighten the pulley cap screw to 20 foot-pounds and finish assembling the pump. That I can do all right, Lee. Are there any other service tips on the pump we haven't covered? In this reference book, Bob, you'll find more service details on the cause and correction of loose pulleys and damaged pump bearings. Well, Tech, I'll be sure to look that information over. Good. Now let's get up to date on some late changes and service tips on total contact brakes. I've got a brake assembly on the bench we can look at. You notice these special loops formed in the table of the new brake shoe? What are they for? Well, the loops contact the brake shield. This helps damp out shoe vibrations, which controls brake noise at its source. On front brakes, the shoe return springs are connected to a hole in the shoe web. On rear brakes, the return springs are hooked to another special loop in the table of the shoe. Why the difference in spring connection? Well, Bob, you're more apt to hear the rear shoes because the rear axle housing acts as a sounding board. By hooking the return spring off dead center, the shoe is pulled slightly sidewise and bears against the support plates. This helps damp out vibration. Oh, that figure's all right. Looks like a good idea. Uh, it sure is, Bob. Now, if you have a case of brake noise, make sure the contact loops ride against the brake shield properly. Use a light and check from the anchor end of the shoe. Slide a four or five thousand feeler between the shoe web and outer support plate at the anchor end. If you can do it, there's no bind at that point, and the shoe's lined up okay. That's clear enough. Anything else to check? Proper return spring tension, Bob. It's mighty important. Even a new spring won't return the shoe correctly if the link it hooks up with hangs up on the brake shield. You see, the link affects spring action. What's more, it automatically adjusts return spring tension whenever brake shoes are adjusted. Okay. Now, how do you check those springs? With a spring scale. Pull the shoe away from the wheel cylinder in the direction of piston travel. You should read 35 to 45 pounds when the shoe breaks contact with the piston rod. If tension is just a few pounds below that, try bending the hooked end to shorten spring length and increase the tension. Suppose that doesn't work. Do I install a new return spring? Yep. Front brakes on Plymouth and Dodge take three coil springs. The other models take four coil springs. Rear brakes on Plymouth and Dodge use six coil springs, and other models use five coil springs. Okay, I get the picture. Fine. Now, at the anchor end of the shoe, there's a carefully designed cam contour, which is mighty important to proper brake action. Yeah, Bob. Don't ever let me catch you filing or grinding that cam, or the anchors either. You hear? I read you, boy. That's a really big point, Bob. 
If an anchor gets loose or the surface is badly scored, you'll have to install a whole new support plate assembly with new anchors. Now here's something else. Always replace a shoe with a factory approved shoe. It is heat treated at the anchor end to prevent wear. Extensive use of the brakes resulting in overheated drums may result in a glazed deposit on the drums. This deposit causes brake squeal and reduces effective brake action. Clean the drums and the lining surface with number two or three hundred emery paper to remove the deposit. And another thing, if there's an opening between the wheel cylinders and brake shield, dirt and water can enter. That can cause erratic or grabby braking and even a high-pitched wire brush noise. To correct a case like that, clean the shoes and drums thoroughly. Use heavy body sealer outside the shield to seal off any openings. Always make sure the seal around each adjusting cam is in place and in good condition. And I will, Lee. I sure appreciate this hot service information on the new brakes. You'll find more tips on them and on the power steering pump in the reference book, Bob. Don't forget to check it. You know me, Tech. I can never get enough advice on keeping these new cars in shape. That goes for every service technician, Bob. Especially when it comes to steering and stopping a car. After all, control of the car is the number one safety factor. And keeping our cars safe is one of our most important service jobs.